أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين إنه خير ناصر ومعين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وخاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين ولعنة الله الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين My respected elders, brothers, sisters in Islam and Iman Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Tonight is the 10th night of the month of Muharram, the night of Ashura. For the protection of the Imam of our time and to attract his special attention to our gathering here, please recite salawat. Insha'Allah, with the help of Allah, I would like to first mention some of the etiquette of, of, of observing the day and the night of Ashura. And after that, Insha'Allah, mention a few words regarding the topic that we've been pursuing. And then finally, ending the majlis with Musibat of Imam Hussain. Tomorrow is the day of Ashura. For those of us who wish to be considered among the Shia of the Ahlul Bayt This is a special time and our behavior and, and etiquette on this day differs from other dates and other times. What we're told is that tomorrow we should adopt a sense of mourning and grieving as if a great tragedy has befallen us. And we should avoid engaging in worldly pursuits to the extent possible. It may be the case that somebody doesn't have an option. They're forced to pursue work or other things. In that case, they should at least in their heart keep this spirit of mourning. But those who are able to, they should leave these things aside and take advantage of the opportunity to demonstrate their commitment to the cause of Imam Hussein and benefit from the spiritual rewards of doing so. Why is it that we are called to do this? Why is it that tomorrow is a different sort of day? I want to quote you a tradition we have from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. That describes the reason for why we need to be in mourning. He says, Shi'atuna juz'un minna. Our Shi'a are part of us. خُلِقُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ تِينَتِنَا They were created from the same substance that we were created from. يَسُؤُهُمْ مَا يَسُؤُنَا That which causes us grief, causes them grief as well too. 
وَيَسُرُّهُمَّا يَسُرُّنَا That which causes us happiness, causes them happiness as well too. Tomorrow is not a day of happiness for the Ahlul Bayt and Muslim. It's a day of great sadness for them. We're told that Imam Sajjad alayhi salam after the events of Karbala, he would, and the family of the Ahlul Bayt, would for an extended period of time mourn what took place. They would gather together, they would dress in black clothing as well too. And they would remember the tragedy that took place. And what we're doing is following the customs and the, and the sunnah of the Ahlul Bayt We're also told that tomorrow, if possible, we should avoid stocking up on goods. Because the Bani Umayyah, la'anatullahi alayhim, used to take this day as a day of celebration and as a day of stocking their goods. We say in Ziyarat Ashura, هَذَا يَوْمٌ فَرِحَتْ بِهِ آلُ زِيَادُ وَآلُ مَرْوَانْ بِقَتْلِهَمُ الْحَسَيْنِ They took it as an Eid for themselves. So we need to take it as a day of mourning. If something is essential that we need to buy, then we buy it. But otherwise we avoid for one day doing that as well. One of the things that we're told to do tomorrow is that when we meet one another, we should greet each other with the line, the following dua, which says, أَعَذَمَ اللَّهُ أُجُورَنَا وَأُجُورَكُمْ بِمُصَابِنَا بِالْحُسَيْنِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ May Allah magnify our reward and your reward for mourning and commemorating the tragedy that befell Hussein, peace be upon him. وَجَعَلَنَا وَإِيَّاكُمْ مِنَ الطَّالِبِينَ بِثَارِهِ مَعَ وَلِيِّهِ الْإِمَامِ الْمَهْدِيِّ مِنْ آلِ مُحَمَّدٍ عَلَيْهِمْ السَّلَام And may He place us and you among those who seek to revenge that blood that was spilled alongside the Imam of the time from the family of the Prophet. Now this dua is a bit lengthy and for many of us who are not familiar with Arabic, it's difficult to memorize. But at least we should understand the spirit behind it. How is it that we should be looking to interact with one another? It's important, brothers and sisters, that tomorrow we take advantage of the gathering and coming together to help each other mourn. And the spirit should be exactly that. We're taught this spirit from the Ahlul Bayt and Muslim that it's one thing to mourn by yourself for a tragedy that, it took, that took place. But when you get together and you see other people mourning and you remind them and they remind you as well too, the benefits are magnified and the effect is also magnified. In dua nudba, we're taught to call out like this. We say, Hal min mu'inin. This is over the tragedy of not having the Imam of our time with us. Hal min mu'inin fa'utila ma'ahul awila wal buka. Hal min juzu'in fa'usa'ida jaza'ahu idha khala. Is there anyone who can help me? I'm trying to cry. I'm trying to mourn. Is there anyone who can help him so that I can extend my grief through his grief and his crying? Is there anyone who is troubled on account of this tragedy so that I can help him be even more troubled because of my, troubling, my being troubled as well too. The spirit is one of interaction and coming together as a community, discussing with each other, talking to each other, reminding each other, doing Amar bil Ma'aruf, Nahi al Munkar, calling each other to the message and the mission of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. And this is the spirit we need to keep in mind. Now, one of the things that we must keep in mind is that we as believers need to always be aware of our situation and not be one-tracked in our approach. Sometimes people on the day of Ashura, on account of good intentions, they end up doing some things which are actually more harmful than good. What I mean by this is that when we come together as mu'minin, there are some things that we do which are natural and very much part of our culture. We greet one another, we say salam to one another, we even shake hands with one another as well too, and we discuss different things. Now tomorrow, it is a day of grieving, but the grief does not give us an allowance or does not, we're not instructed to now, because we're in a state of grieving, now we ignore our social obligations. You see, uh, we being believers, we can be, we can multitask on one hand, 
We can have a spirit of grieving. On the other hand, we can interact with other people as well too. So, when it comes to, for example, saying salam, are we told that tomorrow the importance of saying salam is not there? That somehow tomorrow is an exception to that incredible importance that Islam places on saying salam and the, and the wujub and the obligation of responding to salam? No. Tomorrow also is a day of saying salam as well too. Tomorrow also is a day of shaking hands as well too. Ayatollah Sistani, on his website, he's asked the question, is there any karaha, any sort of dislike, any sort of anything within the deen which says that shaking hands on the day of Ashura is, should not be done or one should not greet one another um, as a means of magnifying the reward for grieving for Imam Hussein. Meaning that, is it okay for us not to shake hands? Is it mustahab not to shake hands? Is it makrood to shake hands? Ayatul Sani says, according to this website, he says that we don't, there's no evidence that says that this action itself is a cause of it being, it's not, it's not, there's nothing which says it's makrood, meaning that it's, it's permissible. And also we're told in hadith that the importance of shaking hands is so much that if, let's say I'm with my brother, and then we happen to separate just the distance of if you were to s take a circle around a date tree, like a palm tree, imagine if you were to go and circle around it. And then on the other side of the tree, we were to meet one another again, we're told that it's good to once again shake hands with our fellow brother. So what I'm trying to convey is that tomorrow is not a day to make things awkward for one another. No, we do greet each other, but we do so with the spirit of mourning. We talk to each other, but with the purpose of trying to help each other. And we need to make sure that we have the right culture for our youth established. These are the things that our youth will understand and they will leave a lasting impression, much more than the words that we can say, the culture that we enact. It should be something where it's not awkward for, what, for, for, for people. And also, brothers and sisters, one more point I'd like to make on this and it's a very important point in my humble opinion, is that we do not have the right to limit the message of Imam Hussein salam to any particular group of people. The message of Imam Hussein is a universal message. And it is our responsibility to make sure that we don't do anything at all to make anyone feel excluded from this message right here. The day of Ashura is a day where people around the world are curious to know why is it that these Shias do what they do. And sometimes they come to the centers, but because people are not tolerant, are not accepting, they don't wish to welcome them, then they end up being turned away from the message of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. There was a revert sister who was conveying this, not from this community, some years back. She was saying that the first time that she had gone to a Shia center was on the day of Ashura. And she went in and she thought that, okay, she has to say salam, right? She, had, she was from the background of Ahlul Sunnah. She said, I have to say salam when I greet Muslims. After all, that's a universal Muslim greeting. But she found that whenever she would say salam, nobody would respond to her. And she felt really bad. And then she was sitting through the gathering. And then after some time, she noticed that after the matam had ended, people stood up and they started saying salam to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So she felt like, what is this duplicity? Why is it that on one hand, they don't want to say salam to me, but on the other hand, they do say salam. So these type of things, we, whatever it is, we have to make sure that we understand the principles. Remember the example of Imam Ali Islam. Here he is engaged in ibadah. He's in, engaged in prayers. But yet when that beggar comes and asks for some charity, he lifts his hand in prayer and makes it clear that the beggar can come and take the ring. Which means that what? That on one hand, his utter focus and attention is on Allah. But on the other hand, part of being focused on our responsibility to, to Allah is to be concerned about the welfare and our relationships with other fellow mu'mineen and believers and muslimin. Peace be upon Muhammad wa We're told by the ulama on the basis of hadith that tomorrow is not a day for fasting. It's better not to fast tomorrow. Rather, what's recommended is to refrain from eating until the Asr time. That too, of course, if it's the case that doing so won't affect our ability to remember and mourn. Because that's what the primary emphasis is on for tomorrow, to mourn, to remember, and to do ziyarah of Imam Hussain 
Now tonight is the night of Ashura and this night is a very special night. There's two incidents that are extremely poignant that we need to go through and remember on this night. One of them we're told by a report that stems from the fourth Imam, Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam. He says that I was in my tent, in my state of illness, when I heard that there was a special event taking place across from my tent. I heard that Imam Hussein salam was addressing the entire congregation of family members and companions who were who are there with him in Karbala. This is on the night of Ashura, a night just like tonight. He says he, with difficulty, he leaves his tent to go and see what is it that Imam Hussein is saying. He hears his father say, Uthni ala Allahi ahsan al-thana wa ahmaduhu ala sarra'i wa darra. I praise Allah with the best of praise. And I thank him for all the good times and all the evil times, all the, the difficult times as well too. He goes on to say, Alhamdulillah, Allahumma inni ahmaduka ala an akramtana bin nubuwa wa allamtana al-Qur'an wa faqahtana fi deen Oh Allah, I praise you, I recognize that you are the one responsible for gifting us with the family of the prophethood and that you are the one who taught us Qur'an and you are the one who gave us understanding of your deen. And finally then he addresses the companions and he says, that I do not know any companions inni la a'lamu ashaban awfa who are more loyal wala khayran min ashabi nor better than my companions wala ahla baytin abarra wa awsala min ahli bayti I don't know of any family which is better and more loving and close to one another than my family but then he tells them that tomorrow they are not out to kill you, it is me that they want. And therefore, I give you permission to leave right now. Take, according to reports, he says, take the darkness of the night as a cover and leave. Now look at the response of these companions on this night. You know, we say in Ziyarat, Ya laytana kunna ma'akum fanafuza ma'akum fawzan azima. That if only we were with you on this night, so we could attain and this day, this tragedy, this whole event, so that we could attain that reward that you attained. One by one, starting with Abbas alayhi salam, they renew their pledge to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And they tell him in so many different expressions, in so many different eloquent ways, that we will not live even a moment when you are not with us, O Hussein. Now, on this night, we see that after this incident takes place, the entire army, in preparation for battle, they begin to do what? They begin to engage in worshipping their Lord. The history books describe it in such a beautiful way. They say that this camp gathered together and they begin to engage in salat and in asking istighfar and um, in reciting Qur'an and doing dua. وَلَهُمْ دَوِيٌ كَدَوِيٌ nahl. The humming that was coming from the camp was like the humming of a bees. Like imagine you have a, the drone of bees that are humming. مَا بَيْنَ رَاقِعٍ وَسَاجِدٍ وَقَائِمٍ وَقَائِدٍ One of them would be standing, one of them would be sitting. One of them would be doing ruku, the other one would be doing sujood. This sight and this scene in itself defines for us one of the essential pillars of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. This was a group of servants of Allah who were performing the responsibility to Allah and the best thing that they could be doing at this time is praying and remembering Allah. As a result of this one action, history tells us that 32 people from the other camp came over and defected and joined the camp of Imam Hussein. While there is no report in history that says even a small child went from the camp of Imam Hussein Islam to the camp of the enemy. We're told that tonight is a night of dhikr, of remembering Allah. It's a night of doing la'an and asking Allah to deprive the mercy from those who were responsible for what took place in Karbala and on the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt 
And it's also a night of doing salawat on Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. <laughs> it's also a night of doing ziyara. The, the recommendation to do ziyara um, of Imam Hussein in Karbala tonight is very high. We are deprived of that tawfiq, but alhamdulillah that we have the opportunity to be together um, in this gathering with the lovers of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I'd like to <coughs> now turn to the topic that we've been discussing, which is that of living in a culture of instant gratification. And keeping in mind the occasion that we're commemorating tonight, which is that of the, of the tenth night of Muharram, I specifically want to discuss the concept of ibadah and worship of Allah and how this lies contrary to the culture of instant gratification. Brothers and sisters, the culture, the predominant culture that we live in is one of doing things at a fast pace, <coughs> of looking for quick sort of results, of doing things in a shallow sort of way with as little inconvenience to one as possible. Any idea of taking pains to be able to achieve the result is kind of shunned and the gratification that one is looking for has to be instant as well too. It can't be something where one has to wait a delayed sort of gratification. Now, when you look at ibadah, the worship of Allah, and what I mean by ibadah here, when I'm referring, that I'm using this term to mean the ritual worship, things like salat, things like Quran, things like dua, ziyara, those type of ritual actions that we're asked to perform. This ibadah is something which at essence lies contrary to this notion of instant gratification. Getting up from our desk when the time of prayers comes is something which requires effort. Going and washing ourselves in a particular way requires effort. Removing all sorts of distractions and standing still and focusing our attention requires effort and, and it's something which lies in contrary to the essence of the culture of instant gratification. So what I'd like to do tonight, inshallah, is for my benefit, inshallah, as a reminder for all of us, to remind ourselves of some of the recommendations that we have from the Ahlul Bayt regarding the importance of worship and how we can encourage ourselves by the blessing of this gathering and by the blessing of remembrance of Imam Hussein to become better worshippers of Allah. I want to first share with you an incident from, that's reported in the books of history. This was at the time of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi. There's one incident where he gathers together an army to, and he's about to dispatch that army to a land in which there are many non-believers. The commander of the army is a companion by the name of Abdullah ibn Rawaha. Now, Abdullah is a very intelligent companion. He's about to leave the company of the Prophet, command this army of Muslims as they venture into the non-Muslim lands. But he realizes one thing. This is the first time he's venturing outside of the Muslim Ummah. So he turns to the Prophet and he says that, Command me to something that I can cherish from you. Give me something that I can take from you and, and work on it and act upon it. The Prophet tells him that in the near future, you will be arriving in a land on which little prostration is performed. Very little sujood is performed on this land, therefore you should prostrate plentifully therein. Very beautiful. He says that, إِنَّكَ قَادِمٌ غَدًا بَلَدًا أَسْسُجُودُ بِهِ قَلِيلٌ فَأَكْثِرِ السُّجُودِ Because there's little sajda being, do, being done on that land, you, your responsibility is to do extra sajda. He says that, زِدْنِي يَا رَسُولَ Give me more. I want more advice as I go on this mission into the non-Muslim lands. He says, أُذْكُرُ الله, Remember Allah. فَإِنَّهُ عَوْنٌ لَكَ عَلَى مَا تَطْلُبُ Because that is going to be a helper for you in anything you want to do. 
you see here that particularly for those who are living in an environment, in a culture, where there are few ideals, Islamic ideals being implemented, where the worship of Allah is found very, in, 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 is found, um, very minimally in, the, in this land, our responsibility to worship Allah is even more. This is the advice that we're getting from the Prophet. It's something that is definitely relevant for us as well. Therefore, we need to understand what is the significance behind this. For example, our prayer, our salat. Okay, this is a night where we're told that the companions and the family of the Ahlul Bayt Muslim, tonight they are engaged in salah. And when Imam Hussein salam, tells his brother Abbas to go to the army and to ask them for a one night respite so they can worship Allah, he says that the reason for that is because Allah knows inni uhibbu salah, that I love salah. So one of the things that inshallah we can try to take from tonight is how can we develop the love for salat? Number one is that we need to understand the importance of this act of ibadah. This is something which is essential that we first gain the understanding of what we're doing and then the quality of what we do will, will naturally go up. You see brothers and sisters, when we engage in ibadah, what we're doing is we're connecting to reality. Oftentimes when we busy ourselves with our day-to-day -day activities, and if we get to the point where we have little remembrance of Allah in our lives, we forget about the reality that lies beyond this dunya right here. Ibadah is something which connects us to our reality and who we actually are. The culture that we're in teaches us that you are what you, what career you are. For example, let's say that somebody is an engineer. The culture says, okay, you are an engineer. You are a teacher, okay, you're a teacher. You're a student, you're a student, etc. Other people say, that, no, you are what you wear, for example. Okay, depending on the fashion sort of style that you choose, this is the type of person you're going to be. This is what defines you as a person. It's a very shallow and one-tracked notion and definition of who we are. Islam teaches us something else. Islam teaches us that no matter what we do, whatever profession we have, I may be a teacher, I may be a doctor, I may be an engineer, I may be a, a homemaker. At the same time that I have that as my profession, that is what I do, at the same time there's one identity that I have that is shared among every single human being. What is that identity? That we are an abd of Allah. We are a servant and a slave of Allah. Ibadah helps remind us that this is the reality of the situation, whether we like it or we don't. When we stand in prayer, we remind ourselves of reality. We say, Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'in. You alone do we worship and you alone do we ask for help. Now this is something which we're not saying that not, we're not saying that if I understand things in a certain way, that's what it is. No, we're reminding ourselves that even if we imagine that we're worshipping somebody, something else or some, somebody else, the reality is that our happiness and our future and our success relies solely upon Allah. This is a reminder of the reality of the situation. That's why we're told the following, that sometimes what happens in our prayer is that we get busy thinking about other things. We start to think about, okay, I'm here in prayer, now what's the next thing that I have to do? How am I going to solve this little conflict that's come up in my business? How am I going to take care of this particular assignment that I have in school, etc.? Allah warns us about this. He advises, He tells it, look, this is in a hadith from Imam Sadiq. He says that, um, it's a hadith Qudsi, He says, in al abd إِذَا عَجَّلَ if a, if a servant were to stand in prayer, and instead of saying the prayer the way it ought to be prayed, he or she hurries through the prayer, Allah addresses the servant saying the following, أَمَا يَعْلَمُ عَبْدِي أَنَا أَنِّي أَنَا أَقْدِ الْحَوَائِجِ Does my servant not know that I am the one who takes care of the needs? Here we are in our ibadah, we're in our prayer, and we're thinking about how we're going to take care of this thing, how we're going to handle this thing, how we're going to take care of this conflict that we have with this person. Well, the solution to all of our problems lies in the one whom we're addressing in our prayer. 
This is the mindset that we need to have when we say our prayers that we're talking to Allah who is fully in charge of everything and can take care of all the needs that we have. The other thing we need to do brothers and sisters is we need to appreciate the blessing of our salat and other acts of worship that we can do. We as human beings have an opportunity through our prayer and through other acts of worship to achieve stations that no other creation of Allah can possibly achieve. <coughs> this is an honor for us. We shouldn't think of it as, as a chore, but rather as an honor. I want to take you to the words of Imam Sajjad <laughs> He says the following, he says that Ilahi, wajibu min qabuli amrik If it were not wajib on me, if it were not an, not an obligation for me to, to pray to you, to actually st stand in prayer and do my salat to you, then I would never have prayed to you. Now, why is Imam Sajjad saying this? Is he saying it because he, never, he's, he would be, na'udhu billah, because he wouldn't be inclined to pray, or God forbid that he would feel some sort of laziness towards praying? Not at all. He said, the reason why I would never pray to you is because لَنَزَّحْتُكَ مِن ذِكْرِ إِيَّاكَ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ ذِكْرِ لَكَ بِقَدْرِ لَا بِقَدْرِكَ He says that I would never imagine that my being able to remember you would be even appropriate. Because my remembrance of you versus the reality of who, who you are, Allah, falls so short that it's not proper for an abd to address his master while falling, while falling so short of the reality. This is the spirit that the Imams are approaching the worship. This is an honor, a gift that we've been given the opportunity to address Allah in our prayer, in our worship. And therefore, we're told that when it comes to praying, we should make sure to take enough time for it. The culture might say that you don't have time. You always have to be working and always have to be rushing forward and always need to be on the move. If you take out time in your schedule to do things like prayers or Quran or Dua, and you take too much time for that, then you might lose out in the long run. <coughs> I'm not saying that we need to suspend our daily activities, our activities when it comes to working on our careers, when it comes to um, building our homes, whatever it is, that's something which is essential, our responsibility as well too. But what we're told is that we need to have some time in our day, on a daily basis, dedicated towards remembering Allah towards working on that portion of us, which is that abd of Allah. And if we don't, then we're going to slowly and slowly lose that understanding. Look at what they tell us. There's one time this one man was present in the mosque and Amirul Mu'mineen Ali Mutab was present in the same place. <laughs> The man is saying his prayers. It's not that he's not saying his prayers. He's saying his prayers, but he's saying them very rapidly. Imam Ali Islam, after the man finishes his prayer, he makes a comment. He says that if he, this man is praying like a crow, which is picking ground from food from the ground. You know, like one pick, one pick, one pick, fast, very fast. He says that if he were to die in this state that he's praying in this sort of way, then he would die, he would not be considered as dying as part of the Ummah of Muhammad Meaning that this type of prayer would not befit somebody to be considered as a Muslim. And then he says that if you want to know, do you want to know who the biggest thief is? The biggest thief is the one who steals from his prayer. Prayer is supposed to be something that we give time to, that we enjoy, that we, we do look forward to, that we use as an opportunity to solve our problems, not as something that we do and try to finish as possible so that we can get back to taking care of our problems. We ought to take the spirit of Imam Hussein and look at here, in the most difficult of situations, the army of Imam Hussein turns to prayer as a means of solace for them. One of the scholars comments, he says that even if Nowhere in the Qur'an had we, had, we, had we been told that prayers is wajib. Even if nowhere in the Qur'an, or nowhere in the deen had we been told that we should read Qur'an, 
nor have we, told, have we been told that we should make dua. Just knowing that the army of Imam Hussein spent the night busy in reading Quran, in making dua, and doing salat, would itself be enough of a proof of us, for us, that we should do these things. We wouldn't need the deen to come and tell us these things. Because that's the example that we have. The last couple of points that I'd like to make in this regard, um, we're focusing on a very important topic, inshallah, it's something which is useful for us, something that we can take as inspiration from tonight, is that when it comes to our approach to ibadah, we should make sure that we understand that there's some difference between wajibat and, and those things which are mustahabbat. Both of them are important. But we have a general principle, which is that when it comes to performing our obligations, then we should never make it be the case that the mustahab things come and conflict with our obligations. Now, how do we translate this into a practical point right here? Let me give you one example. Sometimes the question is asked, and this is a very common question, which is how is it that I can gain concentration in my prayer? How is it that my prayer can, I can find meaning in the prayer? Okay, fine, we read these examples of people like Imam Hussein salam and his companions. They make use of the prayer on this night to achieve so much, but I myself don't find that concentration in my prayer. Look at the tradition we have from Imam Sadiq salam. He tells us, He tells us the secret behind how we can achieve concentration in our prayer. He quotes, this is a hadith Qudsi, he says that Allah says the following, that I do not accept one's prayer unless that person has a few different qualities. One of them is that that individual has to be humble. Number two is that they have to spend their day in remembrance of me. And they have to spend their day not intent on disobeying me. And they have to know my right and the right of my awliya, meaning the right of the Ahlul Bayt This tradition has volumes of meaning. I want to focus on this one point here, which says where Allah in this tradition is telling us that if we want to find concentration in our prayer, find meaning in our prayer, then the secret is that we have to spend our daytime in His remembrance. Practical demonstration is that if we want, if we're looking to make our ibadah meaningful, the approach shouldn't be to see how many other things that we can do in terms of adding other mustahabbat to our prayer. That's something which is useful and in its own place. But rather the focus should be on trying to spend the day in remembrance of Allah by avoiding haram. One who wants to find ibadah and make ibadah something pleasing to them, the secret to it is that the rest of the time when they're not engaged in ibadah, that has to be spent in a state of obedience to Allah. That's why the great scholars have told us that if you want to remember Allah in prayer, remember Allah outside of prayer. By understanding His obligations and His prohibitions and acting upon them outside of the prayer. Please say salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We have a great example, brothers and sisters, in the Ahlul Bayt Imam Hussein. Sayyidah Fatimah al-Zahra alayha salam I'll end with this one beautiful tradition. One time they asked Imam Sadiq, they said that why is it that your mother, your grandmother Fatima is called as zahra He says that the reason why she is called Zahra, the radiant one, the resplendent one, is because that whenever she would stand for prayer, the light that emanated from her mihrab was seen by the people of the heavens. The same way that the stars are radiant for the people of the earth. This tradition, when we look at it, we see that this is what the Ahlul Bayt stand for. If we truly want to be followers of the Ahlul Bayt, we have to look for the same light, uh, that, the, the same light that was contained within them, that it also, some of it comes to us as well too. And the way is to take their way. And their way is the way of ibadah, the way of salat, the way of Qur'an, dua, istighfar. And using ibadah as a means of reminding ourselves of our duty as an abd of Allah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. (laughs) 
صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله الحسين صلى الله عليك يا ابن رسول الله يا يا ابن فاطمة الزهراء أيها العتشان بكربلاء Let us take our hearts to Karbala. Imagine we were there with so many of the lovers of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim wassalam gathered in Bainul Haramain. Imagine we were there on one side we could see the Haram of Hazrat Abbas. The red flag flying high over the dome. On the other side, we would see the dome of Imam Hussein shrine, and we would say to Imam Hussein, "Assalamu alaykum, ya Aba Abdullah." We would say salam to those companions of Imam Hussein. That on this night we're busy calling out to Allah, reciting Quran, talking to their Lord in sajda. We have to ask ourselves, how is it that Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, was able to bear so many difficulties on the day of Ashura. How can one man withstand to see so many tragedies in one day? We're told that in the morning of Ashura, Imam Hussein alayhi salam begins the day by calling out to Allah. He says, Allahumma anta thiqati fi kulli kurba. O oh Allah, you are the one I turn to in any difficulty that comes my way. O Anta Rajai fi kulli shidda. O Allah, anytime anything difficult takes place, you are my only hope. How many times difficulties have come my way? My friends have deserted me, the enemies have gloated over me. It is you that I have turned to, O oh Allah. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, as the day goes on, one by one he sees the great ones giving their lives for Allah. He is crying out, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. But it seems that there is no there is no occasion which is more tragic for him than when his brother Abbas alayhi salam calls out for to him saying his salam. And Imam Hussein when he goes to his side, he says that now my backbone has been broken. But there is more tragedy awaiting Imam Hussein. Allah wishes to try Imam Hussein a way that no one has ever been tried before. Imam Hussein alayhi salam looks around. He sees that he has no one left to help him. He cries out, is there anyone to help me? But who is there to answer him? Imam Hussein alayhi salam wishes to give the enemy one more chance. One more time he will go to them and try to remind them of who he is and what they are about to do. He goes to them and tells them, if you want to, let's resolve this with the Qur'an. Don't you know that I am the son of Fatima? Did you not hear that the Prophet said regarding me and Imam Hassan that we are the Sayyidah Shabab Ahlul Jannah? 
But it seems the enemy's heart is so hardened. They don't wish to listen to Imam Hussein. He is trying to convince them one more last chance at guiding them. But then he is distracted by a cry that is coming from the tent. Where is that cry coming from? Imam Hussein salam, makes his way back to the tent. He calls out for his sister Zainab. He tells her, Oh my sister, give me my young baby. I wish to bid farewell to him. History reports that Imam Hussein alayhi salam takes his baby into his arms. He kisses his son Ali Askar. He now goes back to the enemy with the baby in the arms. One more time he is going to try to guide them. After all, he is the Imam. It is his responsibility to guide the people. He calls out to them and he tells them, Ya Qawm, in lam tarhabuni, farhamu If you are not going to have any mercy on me, then at least have some mercy for this baby. Imagine the scene. Imam Hussein alayhi salam is holding his six month old baby in front of the army. On one side, imagine the beauty of this baby of the Ahlul Bayt. On the other side, imagine what the enemy is thinking. They must have been thinking that now that Imam Hussein is holding up the baby, Maybe our soldiers will lose their motivation. We have to do something to stop this from happening. What must have been taking place on the plains of Karbala? We can only imagine that the air must have been filled with the cries of this young baby. Oh, Halmala, why are you doing this? Why are you taking that arrow and stringing it to your bow? This is, a, this is a war, this is a battle. There's no room for attacking a baby on a battlefield. What has the baby done? What is this crime? Don't you know that Allah commands us in the Quran to have love for the Ahlul Bayt? What are you going to do? It's just a baby. But Harmala Allah is bent on committing the deed. He notches the arrow to the bow, and the arrow gets fired from the bow. It is traveling through the air. At one moment, Imam Hussein salam is holding the baby. The cries must have been filling the air. After all, you can't keep a baby who is thirsty quiet. You can't keep the children quiet when they're thirsty. The children are crying out, al atash The baby is crying out of thirst. But one moment it is crying. The next moment there is nothing but silence. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. Imam Hussein عليه السلام cries out. He cries out to Allah. He says, Oh Allah, you be the judge of what's taking place right here. These are the people who invited us that we should come and help them. But see how they are killing us right now. Imam Hussein is standing with his baby in his arms. The blood is going, starting to flow. He takes his hands and fills it with the blood of his young baby boy. He throws the blood towards the sky and he calls out, Hawana alayya ma nazala bi annahu bi the only way I can bear this is knowing 
that I am being watched by Allah. Suddenly, a cry is heard from the skies. What is this heavenly voice saying? It is saying, Oh Hussein, it is okay. You can leave the baby. You will be taken care of in paradise. But we have to ask one question. How is it that this baby is going to be buried? According to one report, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, before he makes his way back to the tent, he takes his sword and carves out a piece of the earth. He places his own baby boy into the earth and covers the earth up. Why does he do this? Perhaps he knows that, tomorrow, that later on today it will be a day when the horses will be asked to trample the bodies. How can he have his baby boy be trampled by horses? But others say that the baby was actually buried with Imam Hussein. They say that the same way that Imam Hussein was holding the baby to his chest, the same way the baby is buried on the chest of his father, Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein makes his walk back to the tent. What is he going to tell Sakina? She's going to ask, what happened to my baby brother? He's going to tell her that I just asked for some water, but instead they gave me his blood. Allah la'anat Allahi ala al-qawm al-zalimeen wa say'alam al-ladhina zalamu ayyaman qalibin yanqalibun. Mahatma Hussain.